my health was failing, and inside I knew I was dying. I feel like I had lost so much. I lost my job, I lost my health, I lost my friends. So there wasn't really that much else to lose. I got to a point where even in daily life, I thought, is this really worth doing? It's, it's the hardest thing that you can do. Most of the time I was lying in bed, you know, in a fetal position, just trying to hang on. It was very difficult to function because I was constantly fatigued. I was constantly nauseous uh, and I had this, this crazy brain fog. And I looked at him, I said, okay, well, where's the pill to fix me? He's like, no, you don't understand. There's no pill to fix you. And there were many times where I would find myself on the floor and having no idea how I got there or how long I had been there. You know, this is not just something's wrong or something's really wrong. <laughs> like, you know, I'm sick. I have to figure out what the problem is. But I understand how people can take their life. You know, because you, you can hit a point where your, your coping ability is, you know, you just wonder, am I insane? Is this ever going to end? So if you think about it, we're looking at 45 million people in the U.S. at a given time being in a moldy building. Anybody can have problems from a moldy building, a water damaged building. Anybody can have symptoms. Uh, my advice to someone who walks into a building and they start to feel that way is to just turn around and run like hell because <laughs> it's, it's poisonous. The vigilance is just... Exhausting. Exhausting. It really is. Uh, but that is our reality. Air. It brings us life. With that air comes things like air pollution. It also brings mold spores that have always been present in the air. The same science that brought us air pollution has altered the aggressiveness of these mold spores that occur naturally in the air. They can take root in your home, in your business, and in your food. And when they do, they make toxins that change how you think, how you feel, and even how long you'll live. When I was a kid, I was sick a lot. And then as a young man, I weighed 300 pounds. And it felt like every day was a struggle, like I was always using maximum effort to get anything done. The reason I felt this way is that I was exposed to toxic mold. This is a problem that affects hundreds of millions of people every single day. I'm Dave Asprey, and I'm making this documentary because mold affects everyone. The common symptoms are brain fog, cognitive dysfunction, mood issues, sleep issues, autoimmune inflammatory problems, joint pain, fatigue. I've always loved to be very physically active. Prior to being exposed to mold, you know, I love to surf, love to swim, love to rock climb, a weight train, I was an Olympic lifting trainer, I was a CrossFit trainer, a Navy officer. So physical capacity and physical exercise and ex exertion have always been something that's very important to me. One of the biggest challenges has been having very little energy, very little capacity, both cognitively as well as physically. I had uncontrollable throw up every day, migraines, severe hypertension, cardiac arrhythmias, unusual periods, lots of abdominal pain, joint pain, fatigue. The most important issue is that mold and all the other critters that live inside wet buildings will do is to create a collection of symptoms. It won't be one. It might be one that's noticed, but over time, gradually, days pass, weeks pass, the symptoms grow up until a mean number of symptoms, an average symptom, a uh, burden of about 20. Once the mold is growing at some place in your house, it's going to release these mycotoxins. The toxins are poisons. They are chemicals. You can't kill them. They are what are causing the problem in mold illness. And they float around your house, 
and they can deposit themselves uh, on your furniture, on your books, on your possessions, on your clothing. Some people will move or they'll remediate their house, but they don't take care of the possessions. And so the mold is still there and it's still floating around and, it, and the, the, the toxin from the mold poisons the people. I was so fatigued that I would force myself to walk out to Central Park, sit on a rock for about 30 minutes. I would try to read if I could. I couldn't even pay attention to the words too well. And then I would go back to my apartment and sleep. And I would sleep for another 22 hours. That's about all I could do at that time. It was my daughter's birthday. Um, I was taking her to get clothes at Sears and I collapsed on the floor. By the time the paramedics got there, I did not have a pulse. I was very scared because my daughter was there and I was literally dying. The molds are part of the total environmental load. And if you picture yourself as a barrel, uh, molds, pesticides, solvents, bacteria, viruses, all fill that barrel and then the mold gets excess from your house or your office or your work. Uh, it may spill over and then you start getting symptoms, screw up your immune system and your enzyme detoxification systems and then cause illness or dysfunction. Too many people have this little lie in their head. I can't remember anything, but I'm 40, that's normal. It's like, no, something's the matter, you have bad habits. Um, I can't remember anything, I'm 50. Well, that's because I'm 50. That's normal. No, that's because you've been exposed to something or you have bad habits. Or, well, I'm 70. And, well, 70-year-old people have memory problems and brain fog. And I'm like, no, they don't, unless they've been exposed to something or they have bad habits. So it's never normal to have brain symptoms. That's not normal. It's the sign of trouble. Lack of focus and concentration can cause you to lose words when you're talking, can reduce short-term memory in time, can cause uh, reduction in long-term memory. It can cause you to, uh, to become disoriented where you forget your own name for a few seconds or you can be driving around in your neighborhood and kind of look like, where am I for a few seconds you know, until you track. Yeah, it can be devastating. And we have patients that have lost their jobs because their cognitive abilities had declined so, so, so much that they were unable to perform their duties. Unfortunately, exposure to mold and water damage conditions has been widely documented to cause significant um, neurocognitive effects. And one of the most disturbing ones was a study in Poland of young children um, in water damage buildings that showed significant IQ drops. It's totally possible to be exposed to mold to take your IQ from 130 to 115, so you're still normal, you're actually still pretty good normal, but you hate how you feel, because you can tell that there's a big change and a big difference. When I first started getting sick, um, it started with just kind of isolated, like panic, anxiety attacks, and they would get better, and I would just kind of shrug them off, and then it became an everyday thing, and then, the fatigue started setting in and all kinds of other symptoms, tingling in the arms and shooting pains. The most difficult thing for me was that my brain was not working. As time went on, it, it worked less and less until at the end I was really comatose most of the time and in bed almost all of the time, just trying to hang on, uh, which is why I was so desperate to try different things because mold seemed like it had the possibility of being an issue when I read about what stachybotrys could do, but no one else believed that it could be the case. So I think I had to get to a level of desperation before I could even consider the possibility. It was early in the 1970s, perhaps 1969, that fungicides were added to paints for the first time. Unfortunately, those fungicides created mutations in fungi such that the fungi that lived beyond the fungicide created toxins that made us sick and the ones that were from mutant for non-mutants did not make us sick. We put the fungicide into the paint, we're paying a price. So there are molds in the environment and there are molds in food. And people who are sensitive to mold in their environment are often more sensitive to the mold or yeast in their food. 
mold, certain of them, make a poisonous byproduct called a mycotoxin. So it's a mold poison. For example, penicillium is a mold. The poison it makes is called penicillin. Brewer's yeast is the mold. The poison it makes is called alcohol. And of course, we all know alcohol is neurotoxic. Few people know, although this was published in the year 2002, I believe, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, Dr. Ruth Etzel published this, that our corn supply in America is commonly contaminated with these fungal metabolites, that peanuts in America are commonly contaminated with these fungal byproducts. Even today, we're learning more and more about our coffee supply in America being contaminated with these fungal products. These are not okay to eat in large doses. So if you love that cup of coffee and you drink a moldy coffee every day, it may have an adverse effect on your health. The problem is you run from doctor to doctor to doctor trying to get an answer as to why the brain isn't working, the heart is pounding so fiercely, the skin is breaking out. And no doctor today is going to equate a moldy coffee, a moldy bowl of popcorn or peanuts that you get at a restaurant to that symptom pattern. And yet, scientific literature is really picking this up now. Foods that we know are higher in mycotoxins are uh, grains, nuts, coffee, chocolate, wine. A lot of times people who have been exposed find that they can't tolerate those foods anymore. I was sweating and nauseous. Uh, the nausea, I, obviously I couldn't eat. My bowel movements were all changed. And uh, because of that, I lost approximately 20 pounds. Uh, people were looking at me and it was obvious I was very, very sick. I did not know what was making me so sick. Uh, within a matter of two to three weeks, I went from size two to size 14, and then pretty soon I was size 18. Weight gain is, is incredibly common. We ask about it routinely. There are a few people that paradoxically lose weight, but it usually is weight gain out of the blue, without any change of diet, 20, 30 pounds, and that weight won't come off by doing the normal things of exercising and eating less. Psychological symptoms, they abound. Uh, minimal would be just mood swings. People don't feel well, they're cranky, they don't sleep well, they tend to get set off very easily. I just lost interest in everything. Just the, the ensuing depression and anxiety just like took over everything. You know, I couldn't concentrate at all. I would stare at my guitar for months and just not even touch it. I just kind of withdrew. Changes we look for. We call them mood swings. Some people will get down and, and with the, have suicidal thoughts. Other people get agitated beyond agitated. So one of the areas that's also damaged with mold is an area called the amygdala. So the amygdala is in, um, underneath your temples and behind your eyes. Little almond-shaped structure that when that is damaged, people can have rage for no reason and it can devastate their relationships, it can devastate their work, and people will judge them as bad when they're really not bad, they're sick. I would have this sway and moodiness. Um, my girlfriend would, would see me happy at one moment and then immediately just angry or frustrated at, for, for no reason. Even at home, I would be sitting on the couch and I would just feel a wave of of anger or some other emotion come over me, I, I felt like from a, an emotional standpoint, my life was completely out of control and I had absolutely no idea why. So people who have moldy brains hate themselves because they don't know why they're acting that way and they, they don't understand it's medical and so they assume it's moral, that they're choosing to act this way and they hate themselves, I mean the, the loathing and their families hate them too. Because it's like, if you loved me, you wouldn't be an asshole. It's like, why are you an asshole? And nobody knows. And, and the imaging has, has taught me that behavior is a lot more complicated. And it makes me more thoughtful, more forgiving. And when I see people act badly, I'm like, somebody should look at their brain. A hundred years ago, coal miners 
would take a canary into the mine with them. Not for the songs, but because when the toxic gases in the mine got strong enough to kill the canary, they knew they had only minutes to get out, even though they couldn't detect it. It turns out that about 28% of people are genetically canaries for toxic mold. We did draw some laboratory markers, and those uh, came back that we had some genotypes that were considered dreaded, and the, you know that our kids now had as well. We have three children, and Alex, our oldest, had comprehension issues, lost his love of playing piano, was affected in many, many ways. He wound up with some pretty severe neuropsychiatric issues, and I'm happy to say he's doing much, much, much better. Removal from mold is an amazing thing. Drew, our second son, he was supposed to be getting up for school one day, and he called, you know, Mom, Mom, something's wrong, and I mean, he was diaphoretic and hunched over, and then within about two or three days, he. He really couldn't, he couldn't walk. His legs would not support him. We eventually got a wheelchair because it did not look like we were going forward. And he was in the wheelchair for 11 weeks. We started him back on his mold detox. And, uh, and sure enough, within days, days of being on the mold detox, he was able to stand on his legs again. So we thought, this is the pathway we need to be going. No child should have to go through that. Our oldest has had a severe crisis. Drew has had a severe crisis. And I mean, I hold my breath as a mom. You know, I know that Olivia's numbers are very high and that concerns me. The percentage of people that have uh, positive biomarkers varies based on the biomarker. Uh, if we were to look at the genetic predisposition, about 25 to 28% of the entire population of North America have the genetic predisposition to have problems with water damaged buildings. That's a pretty huge amount. That's 75 million people in the United States. The vigilance is just... Exhausting. Exhausting, it really is. Uh, but that is our reality. The modern world with all its high-tech advancements has accelerated the growth of airborne particles Every day the air we breathe is filled with them, both natural and man-made. These include everything from combustion engines and smokestacks to mold and mold toxins. Breathing these airborne particles can make some of us weak and some of us really sick. Somewhere around 50% of the buildings in the United States have water damage. What we know is that anybody can have problems from a moldy building, a water damage building. Anybody can have symptoms. But somewhere between 25 and 28% of the people in the United States can go on to develop multi-system, multi-symptom illness that can be debilitating. They did some uh, work on my previous apartment. They came in and jackhammered the floor out. There was apparently some problems with the pipes, which were about six feet below. The debris was piled up higher than the refrigerator, just concrete. And of course, all the particulate matter went everywhere. And everything I own had dust on it. So it was shortly thereafter that I started feeling really sick. I had had a door installed, and the installer failed to put any sort of moisture barrier. So whenever there was moisture outside, it wicked under the floor about 12 feet. Then I started smelling what I know as stachybotrys. It's the, the mold that grows in drywall. And um, there was just a little tiny strip on the molding. And I pulled that off and got it outside. And I actually did send that in and had it tested. And it was stachybotrys. I lived in a room that was above a sauna and a shower. And the exhaust for that sauna and shower, instead of, by code, routing those to the outside, they had routed those exhaust ducts and just dumped them into the wall. So that created a perfect environment for mold to grow. And they did some construction. They ended up ripping open that wall. And sure enough, there was a, a, a huge sheet of black mold in there. In a certain sense, it was validating to the degree that like, OK, this makes sense. There was one leak that their pipe burst inside the wall, my bedroom wall was shared with that person's laundry wall. So when they tested my house, it, it showed it was the whole building that was infected. And a lot of times people don't even know that they have plumbing leaks, especially if it's a little 
pinhead leak, it could be going on for a very long time and they wouldn't necessarily know until either all of a sudden the floor caves in or the ceiling falls in or somebody's feeling sick and they're trying to figure out why. The mold was concentrated in my bedroom, above my bed, um, within the ceiling, so it was undetectable. My daughter Victoria had similar reactions from the mold as I had given her a bed, unknowing that it had been in my room for five years. And after she got the bed, she started getting the same type of cognitive difficulties, both of her legs, knees. She was having problems and seeing uh, knee specialists. At that time, sorry. You know, just knowing that my children were watching me fail as my health was failing. And inside, I knew I was dying. But it's, it's Victoria getting the same symptoms that led me to believe it was something more than just my health. It was something that was within the home. The problem with modern buildings is that they're really made out of paper. The, they're made out of drywall, um, which you know basically works like paper. When it gets wet, it gets soggy, and it provides wonderful mold food. Uh, we also have HVAC systems where we collect the dust in the HVAC systems, and with moisture in there, that provides a pretty good environment for mold to grow, just even if you don't have a leak in your house. We didn't have this kind of building before 1970. So a lot of the reason that this has emerged in the past 40 years is because we built buildings in ways that no one in civilization has ever done. I moved into an apartment on Fifth Avenue, Central Park Views, everything that I ever wanted, a LEED certified building. So I thought for sure, from an environmental perspective and from an air perspective, everything should be perfect. I started to recognize that when I walked from the elevator to my apartment door, just that short walk, I started wheezing a little bit. I didn't feel very well. I wound up doing what's called an ERMI test. And that test in the apartment was a four, and the test in the hallway was a 13. The problem here is they didn't uh, condition the air before they put it into the building. So if it was 90 degrees out here and 90% humidity, within minutes my hallway would be 90 degrees and 90% humidity to the point where I could take my finger along the wall and actually have water on it. It had turned into a giant mold greenhouse. One of the real problems with mold is that it's very hard for us to control. So if we can build the safest house in the world, we can make sure that it doesn't have any lead paint in it, we can make sure it doesn't have any asbestos in it, we can uh, go out of our way not to use any harmful chemicals in our home, but mold hides. I think one of the most amazing things was that there was very little mold. We had two areas that had mold in them. One was a leak under the bathtub and one was the French doors upstairs and that had not been flashed properly. We didn't have a big black fuzzy wall. We had mold behind a wall um, that nobody ever saw and it got in the air ducts. It started during Hurricane Sandy I live on a sandbar, obviously, this is Coney Island, and the water came from the ocean side and, and the bay behind us. It ran down my street over here. I have a bulkhead behind me. It wrapped around the bulkhead. I was downstairs in the basement with a friend of mine, and we were taping the windows, and the water just piled up. The doors popped in, and I said, it's time to leave. Uh, there's nothing going to save anything in this basement. Some mushrooms grew out of the wall, but at the time, I did not think anything of mold. I didn't know it, it was affecting me. Dead mold is just as bad as live mold. When mold dies, its uh, cell wall desiccates, it gets dry, and it'll break apart into little fragments. And the fragments have toxins on them. This is a disease of toxin. When you inhale those toxins, they're in you. If you don't recognize them as being foreign, you have a difficult time getting them out of your body. Here's a house that was overrun by mold after Hurricane Sandy. It's an extraordinary example of how toxic mold can grow in your home. Here's how mold contaminates a building and makes you sick. First, there are wet or damp conditions in your home, school, or office that come from things like water leaks, poor construction, constricted airflow, air conditioning, and condensation. 
the mold grows sometimes in the open, but more often you can't see it. Spores from the mold and their toxins are released into the air. When there's mold in your environment, it contaminates your furniture, your clothes, and everything you own. You and your family are exposed to the toxins. You get systemic body poisoning from mold toxins. After you're sick, mold can directly invade and infect your already weakened body, which makes you feel not very good, so you stay home, which makes you sicker and sicker, because that's where the mold is. What you can't see can hurt you. We just came out of this house. There's black mold in the ceiling. There's water damage all over the place. What happened here? We did some air testing. Uh, we found mold spore counts were in the thousands for Aspergillus penicillium, also Stachybotrys. So as you walk through the house before we tear everything out, you can see water stains in about 12 or 13 places throughout the house on the upper floors. In the basement, there's a three foot water line. I noticed in the kitchen, I pulled down some of that drywall and there was no marks at all in the paint. And you peel back the paint and there's layers of cardboard just full of black mold. Most times, the moisture originates from behind the wall. So when you're looking at a wall and it looks okay on one side of the wall, we know that when we pull the drywall out, the back of the wall is gonna be 10 times worse than the, the front of a drywall. The first thing that we do when we come into a house is a pretreatment. So we'll fog the house once to kill the major majority of the mold, surface mold, so that it protects the guys. The next thing we do is we're gonna take out all the carpets. We'll take the carpets out first because the carpets are the most porous materials in the house that are gonna hold the most non-visible mold. So once the carpets are out, we have a better slate to work on. Then we're gonna tear out all the drywall. We're gonna go room by room. Once all of the drywall is out, all of the insulation is out, then we'll determine whether or not subfloors have to come out. In this particular case, you saw us ripping up the hardwood floors. After everything is out, all the nails are pulled, all the screws are pulled, all the insulation is gone. Any porous material that could fail an air test has got to be removed. And then after that's done, then we start the fogging. Mold is a living organism. As soon as the fog hits the mold, it foams up. So we know to scrub that area, fog it again, scrub it, fog it again. It's clear that mold is all around us, and it makes us ill. But people with severe mold exposure are often shunned without a shoulder to lean on just when they need it the most. To prove to my family, to my dad and my brother, it was the worst thing. And having them believe in me now is, you know, something I'm still working on. So I would say I lost about 90% of my friends and family due to this. You know, I was living in an environment where, at a certain point, you know, a number, a number of people were sick, and at a certain point, it just became a forbidden topic. You couldn't talk about it, you couldn't mention it, and anyone who's saying they're sick from the air, from the mold, hey, we've remediated this place, you're a hypochondriac, this isn't real, you're making it up. So what we see with people who have uh, mold toxicity is really they start getting into enthusiasm bankruptcy. And so, you know, when the body is healthy and robust, the mind is clear, the spirit shines. But as we start taking arrows, whether it be mold or some other chemical toxins, and the body starts collapsing in on itself, it doesn't have enough to use to get through its day to day, and it can't combust enough to generate that light so that your spirit is, is healthy and intact. Losing my home didn't feel like a big deal at the time. Now, now it does, because it's been three years. I left thinking that I was gonna go to some dry part of the country and I was gonna find a nice mold-free house. So by the time I actually left home, I feel like I had lost so much. I lost my job, I lost my health, I lost my friends. So there wasn't really that much else to lose. I got to the point where I almost didn't feel like a person anymore because I was so sick and I was so out of it all the time. You know, it was really like being comatose all the time. Yeah, except for maybe an hour a day. You know, you pick up the phone and you say, sorry, I haven't called in ages. By the way, I have some weird mold thing that no one's ever heard of. And, you know, they're like, okay, sure, you know, nice to hear from you. Uh, hope you feel better, take care, and, and that was it. So when I see people where one person is affected and 
other family members may not be affected, it's always a touchy situation because depending on the relationship that the couple or family has, it can be hard for someone to understand that a water damaged moldy building can have this big an impact on health, especially if they aren't feeling anything. People are different genetically. They will react differently to anything. Support's been tough. Support's been tough. People understand trauma. People understand cancer. I mean, there's certain things that people get and they know to be supportive and they understand and they ask the right questions. This is one of those things that's kind of taboo. It's one of those things where they think you're crazy. I got to a point where even in daily life, I thought, is this really worth doing? I just feel pain. I feel lethargy. I have no spirit to do absolutely anything. Um, it's, it's the hardest thing that you can do. A lot of people do start to feel hopeless because they can't stop feeling bad. Optimism is very important. It's hard to muster sometimes, though, when you're lying on the couch feeling awful for days on end. You know, I can sit here and talk optimism all I want, but it's, it's been a very tough road. I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna mince words. There were, there were times when I didn't want to wake up. I was in so much pain. Like I said, it's hard to muster optimism, but you kind of have to. It's either that or perish. I understand how people can take their life because you can hit a point where your coping ability is, you know, you just wonder, am I insane? Is this ever going to end? You can no longer just kind of power through it. Most of the time, people with mold illness are not diagnosed. So the psychological effects are the doctors are often saying it's in your head or you're depressed or take some Prozac, but mold illness is not a Prozac deficiency. It's a real thing. And because the doctor has missed it or not diagnosed it, it doesn't mean that you're crazy. It means that you have not been adequately diagnosed. So the key is to not lose hope, to find the resources you need, and to get properly diagnosed. And, and that's the way out. The fight it has been. That is when I, we, we have down days. We have up days, we have down days. And typically those down days are overwhelming. I am tired of the battle, because it is a battle all the time. Scientific research is now documenting the seriousness of mold. Doctors need to know about mold illness so they can properly diagnose and treat their patients. The data is there. Probably at least 50% of my patients have been told that they were crazy or they were making things up or they needed to see a psychiatrist or that there was something wrong with them but it wasn't physical. When I woke up the next morning, I couldn't walk. At first I thought it was an extreme version of like what happened after exercise, except I hadn't exercised and it was worse. And the neurologist said there was nothing neurologically wrong with me which was pretty bizarre because like, I was lying on his examining table, barely able to move. Like, Shifting my legs on the table was utterly exhausting. And he was like, no, you're neurologically fine, which was pretty bizarre. And he diagnosed me as having chronic fatigue syndrome. And clearly for him, all that meant was, I can't help you. If I were a physician talking to the public today about common symptoms I see in mold-impregnated uh, patients, I don't think I'd have a lengthy list. I think it'd be a very short list. For example, jock itch, toenail fungus, vaginal yeast, ringworm. That's about where I'd go with it. Most physicians simply would not believe that asthma, chronic sinusitis, even some cases of bronchitis and some cases of cancer are intimately linked with mold and their poisonous byproducts. This is documented in the scientific literature. So there's this chasm that exists between what we're hearing or talking to our private physician about and what he is prescribing for us. The problem is most doctors don't think about mold. They don't take a good mold history. They don't ask them about where they live or where they work or what's going on. I had a patient, for example, who had mold in his office in one of the air ducts. There was a rotten sweatshirt in there that was full of mold that was blowing mold spores and made him chronically ill. I would say about half of the doctors, there was doubt that I was 
making it up. I was sent to a neuropsychologist to actually prove whether or not my brain was functioning correctly or if I was actually making it up. I saw several local doctors and um, I wasn't getting any diagnosis other than, oh, you're just having general anxiety. So they were just throwing Valium at me and Zoloft and all the typical things. Um, it didn't occur to anyone that there may be something deeper going on. For me, being told this is something you're making up, I mean, I had like seven or eight different systems that were, that were not working at one time. People are looking for help because they know they've got symptoms, but the standard blood tests that are done by the physicians are normal. The standard approach to thinking does not include the time in an interview needed to bring out 25 different health symptoms. The process of um, learning to trust my intuition in learning to avoid mold has been a really amazing thing. I'm a science writer, and it's really changed my relationship to science in, in a lot of different ways. Most scientifically-minded people tend to think in terms of, of placebo-controlled, double-blinded trials, and, and that's great. I mean, we need a lot of those, and we don't have them, and I'm all for it. At the same time, it has forced me to think about what we can understand, how we can use the tools of science when we don't have a budget, when we don't have people in white coats, and we're having to figure it out for ourselves. It took centuries to overcome accepted beliefs about the Earth's place in the universe, the shape of the planet, and even the existence of microbes, bacteria, and viruses. Each wave of discovery has had its resistors, but the truth always wins out. This is happening now. We are seeing mold exposure and chronic disorders in a new light, and science has confirmed what sick people have been saying for years. The problem is around us in buildings with windows that never open and recirculated air. The problem is due to new construction. And in fact, old construction might be safer. But the issue is that if a grouping of symptoms comes up, do not assume it's allergy. Don't assume it's depression. Don't assume you're making it up. Assume a patient is coming asking for help and the duty of the physician is to be responsive to patients' needs. Probably every doctor in the United States is treating mold illness. They just don't realize it. They think it's a combination of inflammatory bowel syndrome and chronic fatigue syndrome and multiple sclerosis. And so there are multiple different diagnoses for these patients. We say in medicine that the approach to diagnosis should be history, history, history. So that's the first thing. So you want to take a very good history and find out if someone has mold exposure, if someone lives in a moldy environment, if they did live in a moldy environment, then moved out, if they have mold at work, what kind of building they live in. And then there's laboratory tests that help to confirm inflammation in the body and hormonal disruption and brain disruption that happens as a secondary cause of the mold that we can actually measure. I started scouring the internet trying to find someone who could maybe help me and when I found my current doctor who treats me for mold she did a whole array of tests so I could get the diagnosis. Then when I moved in to my place six years ago, immediately the chronic fatigue started to get worse. As the years went by, it progressed and it progressed. The pain got worse. It affected my walking. I lost the ability to use my legs. The pain would be so severe. The legs were so weak that I, I had to use braces on my legs and a cane just to prop myself up from falling over, basically. They sent me to a neuropsychologist and he detected that there was some sort of brain damage on the left side of my brain, and it was dying. So my experience, seeing hundreds of moldy brains, is they look what I call a toxic brain. So a healthy spec scan is fat, full, even, symmetrical, beautiful. But the toxic exposure from mold, it begins to shrivel it. So it goes from this big fat, grape and it begins to take on the shape of a raisin, which means there's lower blood flow, lower activity across the cortical surface. It's not one you want. This illness is readily identifiable. The illness is readily treatable. 
the illness does not have to ruin lives. The problem is not confined to grandma's wet basement. My recovery has quite a bit of ways to go. My biggest hopes and dreams are my daughters and I have no more pain. Testing is so hard because there's not enough doctors that are knowledgeable and that are willing to believe. So what we do at Amen Clinics for people who have mold toxicity in their brains is one, a really good workup, partner with a mold expert, and then make sure we're doing all the things we can to repair their brain. The exciting thing is when we see the damage they're not stuck with that. And we can tell how much recovery is possible scanning them three months, four months, even six months later. There's, a, there's a, a principle in functional medicine called the TAC rules. And the principle is this. If you're standing on a TAC, it takes a lot of aspirin to make it feel better. The treatment is removing the TAC. So in the case of mold, you have to remove the person from the moldy environment. Otherwise, they don't get better. We came back from a trip to Colorado where we had done a little bit of camping, basically because I had started to become so hyper-reactive. We started cleaning up our house to get rid of all the mold, but at that point I was so sensitive that I just knew I was gonna have to leave Ohio. And I camped in the backyard and started getting cold. <laughs> it started getting wet. And I said, I'm going south and west where it's dry, and I'm going to stay as long as I need to. And it just turned out that things escalated. So I kept moving further south and further west, and this is where I ended up, in uh, Palm Springs area. I went out to um, the west. I spent some time camping, and I realized that I felt so much better when I was really away from the city and in a place where there weren't too many people and where the, the air was really clean. The mold avoidance helped uh, me feel much, much better. The toxins are very good at um, hiding themselves in fat cells, and the brain has a lot of fat in it, and as long as those toxins are in there, in there, you're probably not going to be able to think as well. So what I found is that if I were to go into a really pristine place, then my body would start shedding toxins really, really fast. So avoidance, but through detoxification, was really important for me. It was so dramatic for me. I mean, the reactions were so dramatic, and then the improvement after I started avoiding mold was so dramatic, like nobody could deny it. The absolute most important thing is get completely away from the exposure. The items that you had present in the home are very likely contaminated and will make you sick. If you move with everything you have, you're taking your problem with you. I went to the doctor and she said, if you don't get out of your house, you could die. You need to leave your house and take nothing with you. So I took my driver's license and my credit card and just walked away from everything. I stayed in a tent the first year and then the following summer I stayed in our garden shed. It wasn't insulated. It had lots of air movement. You know, It wasn't really sealed tightly. And that actually worked better. I did eventually get my home repaired and I can now live in my home. Yeah, in the Palm Springs area, I'm in Desert Hot Springs in a small trailer at a RV park called Sam's Family Spa. One of the things that I need to do and other people that are sensitive to mold need to do is we need to clean everything off when we get out of an environment that's not controlled because it's really hard sometimes to know whether you're picking up mycotoxins or mold spores. So when I started doing avoidance and camping, I had maybe 24 or 25 different symptoms and they just started peeling off. Our treatment protocol depends on how poisoned or how sensitive the patient is. So first history, physical exam, laboratory test to find out what their immune system looks like, then provocation of the molds and then treatment with the injections of the mold. Also, if they have mycotoxins or mold toxins in them, we would then go ahead and give them sauna if they can tolerate it. And we would give them high nutrients like vitamin C, glutathione, multiminerals, multivitamins. And a lot of patients need oxygen therapy because their microvessels have shut down and they don't extract the oxygen. So when you have these conditions, rule out fungus first. Otherwise, you'll run from doctor to doctor to doctor. And you can rule out fungus relatively easy with good supplements aimed at interrupting fungal growth in your body and a diet that literally starves parasitic yeast and fungus. What does mold hate?
hates eggs, hates beef, right? Hates broccoli, hates Brussels sprouts, hates kale, hates celery, hates carrots. And so those are the foods that we want you to eat. So of the 40,000 psychiatrists in the United States, very few of them look at the brain. So what that means is they're flying blind. And when you fly blind, you miss traumatic brain injury, you miss mold exposure, you miss other environmental toxins. And because you miss those, you misdiagnose, mistreat, and hurt people. My advice to anybody who's feeling really sick and they can't get to the root cause and they're getting the proverbial runaround from doctors is to go find a mold and literate doctor who can do the correct tests because I suspect there are people out there who have been sick for years who have gone undiagnosed and they've been misdiagnosed so I would suggest to anybody who just isn't getting better to entertain the idea that it could be mold related because mold is everywhere. It's hard to find a place that's clean. It's hard to clean a place, but I've gone in a very short amount of time from chronic fatigue, dragging myself out, sleeping 22 hours a day, to working again and running half marathons. I just ran a half marathon yesterday. You have to be, what I say, the captain of your own ship. You have to be the head scientist and figure out what is wrong, what helps, what doesn't help. For a doctor to figure this out, they would have to follow you around 24-7, taking notes of everything you do. I still find moments of joy most every day, <laughs> but it's certainly not the life that I ever imagined. Look around. Even if you don't see mold, it can still be there. It can take the life out of you. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but no one is immune from its effects. In medical school, most doctors don't learn about mold illness or mold-related illness. They don't learn about how to diagnose imbalances in the immune system or dysfunction in the brain. And they often dismiss the symptoms that go along with mold as something else or as some psychological issue, which is really unfortunate. So we need to rethink how we're teaching doctors. We need to rethink the curriculum, we need to rethink our approach, and we need to focus on dealing with the root causes of disease and personalizing our treatment. The most exciting thing that I've learned is if you had a moldy brain or a damaged brain and you do the right things for it, that there is a lot of healing that can take place, that you're not stuck with the brain you have, that with the right interventions, often, very often, you can make it better. Listen to your patients. If they're not doing well, if they have concerns of something that might be in their environment, believe them, the science is there. Spend a few minutes on PubMed, you'll be drowning in literature. The information is there. Don't let anybody tell you that there's no science behind this. If you think you have mold illness, there's a way out. And it might be a long way out, but there is a way out, and there is hope. But you have to find a practitioner who can help you deal systematically with the mold illness. One, you have to get rid of it in your environment, and two, you have to get out of your body, and three, you have to repair the damage that's been done. So those are the three steps to healing from mold illness. And if you follow those steps, and you're focused, and you work with an experienced practitioner, you can get better. I absolutely know that in 10, 15, 20 years, the mold illness biotoxin uh, paradigm will be taught in medical schools. It, it has to be. There are so many patients. Uh, there's so much data in the published literature. Unfortunately, it's just not in the literature that most doctors read. It's in magazines, journals like Toxicology, as opposed to the Journal of a Medical, American Medical Association. But when I started this, I was, I was skeptical, like any doctor is. But after I saw my first 15 mold patients who were all going to the same school, and I saw that they have the same history, they have the same physical exam, they have the same abnormalities on lab work, and then when they were treated, the ones that took the treatment got better, and the ones that didn't, didn't. So I am convinced, beyond a shadow of a doubt, now, five years, 700 patients later, I'm even more convinced. What we see in the U.S is a huge increased number of people sick in water-damaged buildings that we don't see in other areas. 
So are we doing the right thing as far as mold goes in the U.S.? No. Can we do a lot more for the 50% of U.S. buildings that are water damaged? Yes. Should we be monitoring our children? Should we be monitoring our schools and our workplace? Yes. Our children and workers are given rights to safe schools and safe workplaces. Our renters are given rights to safe homes and apartments. Things get better, and they can, you know? And you can't, you can't just, you can't necessarily get through everything based on kind of willpower. It takes a little bit more than that. The sky may have fallen, but we have to move on. You have to take your situation for what it is now and do everything in your power to help yourself and your family. The question is, do we want to know? And it's scary. I don't think I wanted to know either. Your home environment can be a scary place for you. And it's so scary for us to think that the medical community is not taking care of us and that they, they don't know what's in the literature. So that's a scary thought. And I, I think that we don't really want to know that. Um, but I, I think we need to. I would encourage people to really tune in and really listen to their bodies and see their bodies as um, a source of wisdom rather than expecting the answers to all come from authorities from outside. Because the fact is, I mean, we need authorities from outside who have studied this and have something to offer. But we don't have it right now. We don't have it nearly as much as we need. So I think people need to um, accept that and, um, you know, turn to one another for support, learn from patients, and learn from themselves. My health now, and I'm not even to the peak, my health is better than it almost has been the rest of my life. So for me, it's been a godsend to get this far, and I'm so happy, and I hope I can convey to other people that you might actually get better than you were before. So, you know, keep your chin up and, and keep trying to make this thing work for you. Walking up to the Cross of Martyrs is, is a, a very special place. It overlooks um, the whole city of Santa Fe, New Mexico. And the actual cross was built by um, kids from the high school, when I went to high school here, from the welding class. And the walk is a steep incline, um, which I would have never been able to do a year and a half ago. And it, it just really is a big accomplishment for me to know that I have come so far and my daughter can walk up with me instead of both of us having matching knee braces and everybody looking at us wondering what's wrong with us. It's a whole new step, it's a whole new life has been breathed into me. People who have major problems with their health have something that's very valuable on the other side, which is in, in spirituality we call it gnosis. It's an understanding of who you are fundamentally. And you can turn this and turn this malady into a gift because you become so hyper aware and sensitive to your environment, to the foods that you eat, your interactions with people, hey, that shirt that you're wearing is moldy. And so you have to develop these senses to become more hyper aware. And the lack of awareness is the malady that's really infecting our society. And so a lot of times on a spirit level, the lesson that we learn from something like this really turns us around and liberates us. So when we become more conscious and aware, we then have the capacity to take that into other facets of life. And this, this challenge has put them through a furnace and on the other side, they're a fully cooked and enlightened human on a lot of levels. They're spiritually lighter, they're awake. 
and it's a gift and they, and they see it as such. So if you're in a situation where you feel like you've lost hope and you've been at this for so long and you've tried all these things and it's just roadblock after roadblock and you're at the point where you just don't have the energy, you don't feel like fighting anymore, it's because you've used up all your willpower trying to do something that isn't fixable with the trajectory you were on. So you have to change course, right? And as you start to change course, as you learn what it is that, that is bothering you, learn what it is that's going to enhance your vitality, what happens is you have some energy that gets liberated. And you use that almost like profit, right? You, you start to use that and reinvest it in getting better and better and better. And eventually that enthusiasm comes back, that hope starts to come back, and you feel well. It's really hard on the other side of it to think that it's hopeless, but that's because you've been clouded by this really spiritual malady that comes from being under the burden of something like this for too long. And I'd love to say to you that there's plenty of hope. What you have to do is just get on the other side of the problem, and then hope starts to bubble back up. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that we're quicker to recognize when things are going wrong. Um, I'm hopeful that this, the, the entire medical community can, can get on board quicker. And I don't know what the ultimate momentum shifter is going to be, but at some point um, this will be recognized. We won't be seen as such oddballs, but we'll be seen as people who I think on the kind of got hit early. Um, I'm just hopeful that our kids don't have to go through this, uh, that they don't have to, to fight for their, uh, for their medical treatment. They won't have to fight to have a clean home. They won't have to, I mean, everything's been a fight. And it would be nice if we didn't have to fight, if we could discuss, if we could learn and educate together. Um, that, would be, that would be wonderful. And I think we're at, kind of at the forefront, um, but we're not there yet. But I'm hopeful we can get there. Mold and mold toxins in the environment and mold in food does something more than make you physically sick or even dysregulate your emotions. There's something that, that lives in your chest or in your heart, something that isn't easy to measure, but something that most people know about. In the East, you, you call it a chi or a life force. If you're my grandparents, it's your vim and vigor or the spark. But whatever you want to call that thing that's inside you, think of it like a light. And mold makes the light dimmer. And that isn't OK. It's hard to walk a mile in another man's shoes. It's hard to hear them voice the pain they're going through. It's hard to know what's really Just what they see I've got some sympathy 